try to cover different aspects of decision making under different conditions. So we started with the mark of decision process where all the all the decision making process actually turns out to be a computational problem because the agent has knowledge of the model of a model of the environment, an accurate model of the environment. And then it's able to forecast or predict what will be the outcome of uh, her or his decisions and therefore can compute uh, the optimal policy. This is done through the help of a concept which is the value function for a given state of the environment or for a given pair of states and actions. And the equations that govern this uh, optimal value function are the Bellman's equation. And then we moved on to, to discuss the situation when uh, uh, the model is known, but the environment is only partially observable, in which case one has to introduce some notion of a memory over which the, the observations are, are collected and organized. And when the memory is perfect, there is this notion of belief which emerges, which is connected to, to Bayesian inference. And then in that case as well, provided that memory is perfect, it's possible to write down a Bellman equation in, in, in the belief space, which uh, is very helpful theoretically, but uh, only partially so from, from the practical point of view. And then we move to, to the opposite uh, situation in which there is a, a perfect observability of the environment. States are given uh, together with rewards uh, as as a feedback from the environment to the agent, but uh, uh, the laws that govern the environment, that is the model of the environment and how rewards are distributed, this is unknown to the agent. So the agent has here to rely fully on, on, on its previous experience in order to make good decision making. And uh, for that particular case, we saw that uh, it's possible to uh, exploit the knowledge that we developed for the mark of decision process into this particular case, which leads us to stochastic approximation methods such as uh, Q-learning, which I gave you an example. Uh, then supposedly in the last two lectures, you should have had a glimpse of how these algorithms work when they are coupled with the, uh, a neural network which plays the role of a new universal function approximator for, for the for the Q function in that case. And, and this basically are the key ingredients. So at this stage, if you open up a research paper by DeepMind, you should be able to follow the line of thought, okay? You should have the conceptual tools to follow this. Of course, it might be some points which are pretty difficult and hard. There are lots of technicalities. It's subject of current research, but you should be basically in, uh, in a position of grasping the, the, the major the major things that, that are happening there at the technical level. So for today, for this, this last lecture, I would like to go back again onto a very simple problem, which is the two-armed bandit problem. Actually, an even more simplified version of that. In order to see in more detail what are the issues and the difficulties uh, which are related to good decision making when the knowledge about the environment is, is uh, uh, limited. Okay? So the, the workhorse for today will be the following uh, decision process. Like in all bandit problems of, the, of this kind, this is the stochastic bandit problems, uh, there is just one state of the environment. And in this particular case, we will be considering two possible actions, an action zero and an action one. The outcome of action zero is you get back to the state with probability one and reward zero. And the outcome of action one is that you get back to the original state. So with probability P, you get some reward uh, one. And with probability one minus P, you will get some cost. That is a negative reward minus one. Now, so this is basically 
Another version of the coin tossing problem, short of coins today. Uh, so there's a, just one coin here, <laughs> sitting here, and the decision is about tossing the coin, okay, and then if it's head, you get one euro. If it's tail, you lose one euro. But you have another option, and this option is I don't want to toss the coin. I will just pass. And if you pass, basically nothing happens. And you know in advance, you are know, know that this is not going to cost you anything. Okay. So you see, it's a mixed situation, the one that we have in mind here, in which there is one action about which we know everything. So we know this part of how the environment reacts to this particular choice of action. But we don't know this. Okay. So this is basically a problem with a single arm bandit with a, the option of passing. So first of all, let's try and see why this problem can, can be highly non-trivial, even though it's, it's very simple. Uh, so let's let's first have a look at it at it very very simply just out of out of insight so what is the optimal policy for this process assuming you knew p you knew how much this coin is biased what's the best policy if p is higher than 1 over 2 the optimal policy is to always pick action one. Otherwise, the opposite. Okay. Action, yeah. Okay. At one half, you can go either way. On average, you will get the same. Very good. So what is what is the value? the optimal value for the unique state that is there. You remember, the definition of the optimal value is the maximum of the gain that you can get in the long term. That is, the accumulated rewards discounted, averaged upon choice of the optimal policy. So in this situation, what is the value how much do you get in the long run? Speak up. Sorry, one at a time. We're talking about? Yeah, we're talking on this, about this case. The question is, we are in this case. This is the optimal policy. What's the average cumulative gain? You remember the definition. It's the sum of all rewards in the future discounted by the powers of gamma to the power t. So how much is it? One over one minus gamma. That's, that's one thing that is there because that's the sum of all discounted factors. And then 2p minus 1, which is the average that you get every time. Very good. Otherwise, if you played if you are here in this case, what's the optimal value that you can get? Zero. Okay. Okay. Then we can also ask questions about another object that we introduce, which is the quality function of an action. Okay. So how much you can get in this case? if you play action one. So what does that mean? It means that I'm playing action one at the beginning. Then how much, this is my first pick for the action. How much do I get in the, in the long run for this? Yeah. 
we're in this situation. So the best, the best policy, which is, is always to play action one, right? So you played action one for the first time because that's specified here. That's the definition of a policy function. So you get, at the first round, you get 2p minus one. And then you follow the optimal policy, which is always to pull action, to pull the arm one, so take action one. So it will be, next time will be gamma times 2p minus one, and again, and again, and again. So in this case as well, this is exactly 2p minus one. That was also clear from the definition because the value is the maximum over the Q function over all possible actions. And what is the quality if I pick zero as first action? So the first thing I do here is I take action zero. So what do I get in the first round? Zero. And then I switch to the optimal policy, okay? What would I get in the second run? I would get gamma times 2p minus one divided by gamma, and so on and so forth. So that's just one step in which I take nothing. So time elapses, I have discount factor gamma, and then everything goes as previously. So in this case, the optimal value for this decision is gamma times 2p minus 1, 1 minus gamma. This factor gamma is, is the fact, the price that I have to pay because I didn't start with the optimal action at the beginning. Now let's move to the other case. So if I start picking action 0 and p is lower than 1 half, what will be the value function in that case? It's, the, it's how much you can get conditioned on the fact that your first action is zero. How much do you get? Zero. And in this case, what do you get? So you, you first play this and then you get 2p minus one. No, that's the first time, so there's no gamma. It's the first time you do, and then, and then zero. So this is 2p minus one. Notice that this is smaller than q star zero, and this is smaller than q star one. And like I said before, remember that V star max is always the maximum over all possible actions of Q1. So in this case, it's a maximum between Q0 star and Q0, which is verified. All these things are just consistency checks that we, we're doing this thing right, and then uh, it's a very simple calculation. Okay, so so... In a second, we will redo the calculation in the case where we allow for some regularization, okay? So we allow for, for a policy which is non-deterministic by putting some additional reward with the weight epsilon. You remember the regularizing term in the, in the Lagrange functional, so we will discuss this in a second in order to see how we, we actually recover these things in the limit of epsilon tending to zero. This will be interesting for the following. But for the time being, I just want to focus on, on one particular uh, situation. And th th this is a situation where you don't know what P is, right? So that's a case where you, you're model free, partly in the sense that you know part of the model, but you don't know another part of the model. And then I'm, let's, let's try and think about possible ways of making decision in this case. Uh, so suppose that you start by deciding I want to flip the coin, right? Because if I don't flip the coin and I'm not knowing, perhaps it's, so, uh, it's, it's always a win if I flip the coin. So I have to try. So I give it a try. 
and then I get a minus 1. Okay, fair enough. And then I take in some sequence and then I keep on flipping. And I take 1, 1. Suppose I'm here in this situation. So on average, there will be more 1s than minus 1s in the long run. But now, for some reason, I'm a bit unlucky, and I get a string in which there are more minus than plus. This happens, right? Especially when the sequence is short. Then, what is the best estimate of P that I can take out of this sequence? This is my sequence of rewards starting from 1, 2. So this is R1, R2, R, I don't know, RT. What's the most likely value for P given this sequence? This is a Bernoulli process, right? What is, what is the best estimate? The number of times that you get plus 1 divided by the total number of trials, right? And then, in this case, it's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 over 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So my best estimate of P at this time T is 3 over 5, if I didn't mess up with the numbers. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, it was 7. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yes. It's seven over ten. Okay? That's my best estimate with the uh, sorry, it's gonna be three over ten, the, the opposite. Okay, because I, I have to count the plus and not the minus. Sorry. <laughs> Everybody on the same page here? Okay, so based on my current estimate, I think that at this time that the coin is biased is unfavorable bias because it's below one half. And according to this experience, what is the best policy that I can take? Choose zero, okay? And if I choose zero, I will get the sequence. So I, I've been just pulling arm one for all the sequence and then I start I switch to zero, and then I get zero, zero, zero. Is my estimate of this thing changing? No, because I'm not flipping the coin any longer. So I, I stay frozen in this state of knowledge based on my previous experience. And I cannot get a, escape from that. So eventually my behavior will be heavily suboptimal. Even if the true P here was, I don't know, anything larger than one half. But this can happen. For any finite sequence, it can happen that your estimate is below one half, even though your true average is above one half. So what's the trouble here? The trouble here is that we've been too greedy. We've been trying to exploit the chunk of information that we obtained up to that time in order to decide something which will go on for a long time. These strategies which are too greedy pose severe risks. And this is a common lesson. It's not something that is holding only for this particular system. It holds in general. And I will state some very general results about this in a second. So what, what is the way out of this? Well, sometimes allowing for suboptimal actions, OK? So even though at this stage my knowledge would say you should play action 0, I allow some room for uncertainty and say, OK, perhaps I shouldn't be too confident about my results at that time. I should allow for some room for exploration. That is, 
I'm taking deliberately suboptimal choices, which apparently, based on my current knowledge, look suboptimal, but might turn out to be optimal in the long run. So if I do that, basically what am I doing is, is I'm refraining from taking hard decision. I'm allowing my policy to be random rather than deterministic at any fixed time of my, of my process. Okay, so this is really in a nutshell a very famous concept which is the exploitation exploration dilemma. It's something that emerges basically in, in all tasks in which there are some resources which have to be allocated. And you do so sequentially. So if you, based on incomplete knowledge, go on the fully exploitative side of the problem, of course, of course, like I just showed you, you will be suboptimal. But on the other hand, if you go and explore continuously, so without ever quitting your exploration, you will also be suboptimal because you know that the optimal decision doesn't explore finally. So there must be a way of balancing these two tendencies in such a way that eventually you approach optimal behavior with the least possible loss. Because exploring has a cost. In this case, if I explore, Okay. In this particular case, I'm exploring the benefits of an action which might turn out to be negative. In the short run, it seems negative. Okay, so I have a loss. I'm losing time which I could spend by using the optimal action while well, I'm not doing that. Okay. So this is a, this is a key concept, uh, and it's very important. Notice that this is a very peculiar case. Like I said, it's very asymmetric because one action is perfectly under control of the agent and the other is not. In fact, if you ask the same question the other way around, so assume now that your probability of the coin is less than one half, and by chance your sequence is favoring you, okay? Then what will you do is you will insist tossing the coin. But at some point, at some point, if you keep on tossing, your sample average will come below one half if the true average is below one half. And at that point, you will revert eventually to action zero, which is indeed the best one. Okay. This is to say that in this particular case, the things don't work in the same way if you are above or below one half. But this is a peculiarity of this particular example. Yeah. Sure, so let's assume that P, true P is less than one half. Okay. And let's assume that your sequence here now, so this is the case P larger than one half. And now let's assume that you're in this situation and then you get a string which is basically say one, 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 minus one, one, one. Okay, so your estimated P would be nine over 10 in this particular case, because all of them are ones except one. Okay. So you are under the impression that the best thing to do at this moment would be to pull the arm one, to make decision one, even though this is not the case. But if you act greedily in this situation, so you just say, okay, I will switch full throttle on using one. In this particular case, you keep on accumulating information so that eventually, there will be some minus one popping out. After some time, this PT, this, this estimate P will again, so as a function of time, of trials, this P initially is high. So let's say that this is one half. So initially at some time after the trials, it's something like this, goes high. But if your true P is here, eventually it will go below that threshold because it has to reach 
this one, the probability one, by the lower large numbers. So that, with probability one, it will cross below the line. And when you cross it, and now your p hat p has become smaller than one half, then you switch again to this. And you never leave this one. But now there's no problem, because this is, in fact, the optimal action. So in this case, there is no dilemma. You can be greedy. But in the other case, you cannot. But like I said, this is a peculiarity of this situation. Because if you think about ordinary situation in which you might have here two different outcomes. So this, this also is random. So sometimes you, you don't pay anything. Sometimes you pay a price. Or you don't know what price you have to pay for waiting. In that particular case, when you don't know that, again, the situation is totally symmetric. So this exploration, uh, exploitation exploration dilemma is present all over the phase space of possible configurations. Okay, so this was just a word of caution that uh, this is a, a super simplified model, which exposes some aspects, but does not, does not have the full concept co complexity of the decision-making process. So, here, we, we would like, to, we would like to, know, to know more about this, right? And uh, uh, it seems, this thing seems to, yeah. Uh, yeah, sure, sure. So you can ask this question in different contexts. So you, you can fix the time horizon. And then you can ask questions about uh, uh, how much should I explore if I want to optimize over a certain time horizon. So this, the same kind of issues emerge, provided that time horizon is long enough. Okay. So if you have a very short time horizon, of course that that. So think think about it in terms of gamma setting gamma to zero. If you just make one decision, then okay, it goes over and that's it. But if you have a sufficiently long time horizon, the same kind of dilemmas emerge. So, uh, in uh, what was I saying? Yeah. Uh, so, th the idea that emerges here is that the degree of exploration should go down to zero somehow, right? So, at the beginning, you want to explore a lot because you want to sample what are the outcomes of different opportunities. But then, as you gain information, you would like to slow it down. And how much can you slow it down? Can you slow it down arbitrarily? No, because if you stop suddenly, you know that there will always be, uh, even with a small probability, there will always be instances in which you will stick to suboptimal decisions. And this is bad. How, how, how would it be then? The Poisson distribution would, be the, would basically mean that you have some characteristic time which you allocate for learning and then you stop. Huh? Yeah, yeah. It's even worse. Yeah, it's a scaling low, but it's one of the worst kind. <laughs> Very good. So this is something that in the Bayesian uh, literature is called Thompson sampling. Okay. So this is, if I, if I can translate what you're saying, you maintain a belief about this parameter. So you have a, some sort of prior probability distribution for what this P is. And as you get information, you update it. So it will shrink. And we concentrate around the mean value. And then you decide what to do according to this distribution. So you pick one possible value and you decide according to this. This exact algorithm is called, is called Thompson sampling. Yes. So assume you're doing Bayesian inference. So you're in the setting of uh, partially observable Markov decision process. Because these are, these are the parameters that you don't know. 
So you want to infer them according to Bayesian inference. You start with the distribution for this p value. Say, I don't know anything, it's flat, for instance, okay? Any value between zero and one has the same probability at the beginning. Or I start with one half because I think I have my opinion that this thing is concentrated around a, a fair value, okay? I cannot set probabilities to zero, otherwise they will never surge in Bayesian inference. But I can set something which is closely picked. You choose. You choose a prior for your parameter, depending on what you think you know in advance about this, uh, this system, about this coin. And then you start flipping it. And as you flip it, your posterior distribution will be concentrating around the true value, the real mean, right? So that after a certain number of trials, you will have a posterior distribution There are too many p's, of course. So this is the posterior probability distribution for the parameter p, which can go from 0 to 1. Okay, And since this is a Bernoulli process, if you start with a prior which is flat, for instance, so this is a con conjugate prior with respect to the Bernoulli distribution, so this will be beta distributions. And doesn't matter. They have a like, shape like this. And eventually, after a long time, this will peak and become narrower and narrower around this value, right? So this is what the outcome of. And then the suggestion of this algorithm is that, okay, I have my one half here, and then with this probability, I pick the action that is optimal if P is less than one, otherwise I pick this one. You see? At every time you have a probability distribution for your p. And there is, therefore, you have a certain estimate of how likely it is that your system is really below the threshold of one half. So according to this probability, you pick your, your optimal decision. Your optimal decision. So if here you have a probability, I don't know, 10% that your parameter is below one half, then you will pull action zero with 10% probability and the other one with 90%. And of course, as this process goes on, this distribution narrows and you will be less and less exploring. But you always do, okay? Because there's always a little tape here. This is one possibility. So this is Bayesian. This is essentially Bayesian in, uh, in spirit. But now, Based on that probability, you, yeah. For each step. At each step. At each. This won't change. This won't change. Yeah, and eventually you're going back to one. You, you, eventually you are, because you, you, even when you are in zero, there will be a probability that this is the good or bad action. So you switch with a certain probability to the other action, and then you increase. Yeah, so you never get stuck, because there's always some exploration. You go there because you go to zero because you still think that there is a small probability that actually the parameter is not this one, but it's this one. <laughs> Eventually, well, well, the point is exactly this: how fast you approach this choice, how many times you don't do this. Because if you knew from the outset with infinite precision what the p would be, you would be doing this string of actions which is always the same. But you don't know it, and the point is exactly like this. As you accumulate information, still there will be some time that you pick the wrong action. And actually, the point I want to make is that that's exactly the thing that you have to do. You don't have ever to stop exploration. You have to make it smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, but always be finite at any finite time. So this is a good algorithm for bandits. Actually, it's been proven a couple of years ago, I think, uh, that this algorithm is asymptotically optimal in, in, a, in a sense that it's a bit technical. But this is not the best thing you can do. 
in absolute, because for this kind of problems, you can even write down the, the optimal policy, okay? Like we did, you can do this for more complicated problems. Uh, it's not the super optimal solution at all times, but it's, it's a very good solution. So this is a good idea, this one, in this context, okay? One, one limitation of this algorithm is that it's, it's Bayesian, okay? So suppose you don't, you don't want to use priors. You don't want to use, you, you just want to rely on the string of observations. Then in that case, there is a very similar algorithm which works as well. And this is a class of algorithms which are called UCB from upper confidence bound. There's a whole wealth of these algorithms with, with various uh, uh, declinations. Could you put? Upper confidence bound. So what's the idea? Again, if you don't, if you're not Bayesian, you don't know this distribution. The only thing you know is, is this the current, the value where this distribution has, has its own peak at every time, which is exactly this. Sorry, not this peak, it's average, which is exactly this value in the long run, okay? So that's the, ma the maximum likelihood estimate of, of, of your, of your uh, parameter. And then what you do is simply, basically, you, you ask, a statistical question and say how confident I am about this estimate. I want to be confident to, I don't know, 95%. And then you account for this confidence by allowing some time to say, okay, if I'm confident at 95%, 5% of the time I will just pick the other action, which is again another way of, of uh, allowing for exploration. This is just to say that all algorithms which are provably good, says that they perform well or optimally in certain, in certain limits, have to account for this possibility that your current limited experience is actually not reflecting in full the real properties of the system. So, and then can we get from this very simple example an idea of how we should reduce exploration as we increase the number of trials. Yeah, actually, it's, it's a very simple uh, estimate that, that one can do in this case. So, and I will report that here. So let's, let's ask the following question. It seems to, be, to us that, that a key ingredient is to estimate what is the probability that my estimate of this unknown parameter after t trials is less than one half. <coughs> and we know that the actual p is larger than one half. So what is the quantity which governs this probability. Large deviations, okay? Is anybody familiar with large deviations or the other way around? Is anyone totally unfamiliar with large deviations? You had a course on that. Some of you had a course. You have no idea what I'm talking about. Okay. So, given that this is the true average, and what is, according to your opinion, the probability that this event occurs after a very long time? How does it, how does it decrease in time? The key result is that you can show that this probability goes down exponentially. With some rate, which in this case takes this form. 
And this object is called the Kuba Kleibler divergence. Okay, for those of you who had done large deviations, it should be familiar. For those of you who haven't, doesn't really matter. The important thing here to, here to notice is that this is falling down exponentially with the number of trials. So NT is actually the number of times action one has been chosen. Okay. So we want to kill this probability in the long run. Yeah, in this case, this probability this is the probability one half. This is for the I'm, I'm, this is Bernoulli. This is for Bernoulli distributions, and this is Bernoulli with the pro, with the with yeah, but this is the threshold. This, this applies to any quantity here which is below the true P. You can always write down this expression with a property. But doesn't matter, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I don't wanna spend too much time because it, it's just uh, for the sake of explanation that this thing should be exponentially in the number of trials. Therefore, if you wanna kill this, If you want to kill this, the best thing you can do, so actually the, the least thing that you can do is, is to have this thing grow logarithmically with the, with the number, the overall number of trials. Okay. Because this object is positive, and then if nt goes like some, some constant times logarithm of t, with a positive constant here, of course, for large t, much larger than one, then this quantity will go down like a power law. B is a number, which depends on happy, of course. It's a function of, of a happy, if you wish, yeah, of course. This is a function of happy, and this is a function of happy. D, D is a function of P. Yeah. Okay, so um, what I wanna say here is, is this is basically telling us that there is a strong bound on the number of times that you have to visit suboptimal, uh, suboptimal uh, actions in this case. You cannot go faster than that. Because if you go faster than that down, then you will not be able to contract sufficiently fast your probability. Okay. So that's the basic reason, reason for large deviations theory. That you, you have to keep on Exploring, sampling, otherwise your distribution will not shrink around the actual value. Yeah. Yeah. Is there? Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming that, that this is Bernoulli, actually. That's what I'm writing. So it applies to all distributions we don't have fat tails, okay? I'm, I'm just com very conventional. It's it's hard enough when you have coins, so you don't need to. Yes. I'm considering the longer. Pardon? You're happy of the exponential means that you will have to take the bad action 
An exponential is smaller number of times with respect to the other one, but it doesn't mean that you have to stop. That's exactly the point I'm making. So in order to have this thing go to zero with t, you cannot just cut it short. If you're greedy, this nt will stop at a certain time and will be finite. And there will always be a finite probability that actually the system was in the other state. In that case, you act sub suboptimally. So you want to allow for this thing to grow, to grow as slow as possible. And this as slow as possible is the logarithm. It's the choice of the algorithm. No, we don't want the power law. We want something which goes to zero. And the slowest way to go to zero is a power law. Because if you go very fast, this means that we are choosing the bad option many times. Yeah. So the, the point is here is that the following one. You want to compress this, right? And that you, want, that you would like to, to compress it fast. But you don't know in advance whether you're choosing the good action or the bad action. OK? So that's the compromise that you have to hit. Otherwise, you will be on either one of these two sides. N of t is the number of times that you're choosing the good action. No, sorry. No, this is in this case, you would choose the bad action. Sorry, action zero. Sorry, sorry, that was my mistake. Because in that case, you would think that you are below one half. So you would choose zero. Sorry, this was the source of confusion. So you want to limit this number as low as possible because these are the wrong choices that you make. But you still want to have it fast enough to kill this term. So that's a compromise. You want to keep learning, but you don't want to do too much, because otherwise this will impact your performance. There was a question? OK, so then this becomes technical. OK. Uh, I can only state the result, which requires some, some calculation that we don't do, actually. And the result, this was just to give you some, some sort of intuition about the result. But then uh, it's, it's now time to, to state the, the generic result, which is valid for any So consider now the situation where you have a, any, any number of actions. So you have one, two, three. And all of them give some p1, 1 minus, sorry, p3, 1 minus p3, p2. Okay, so this is an example of a K arm Bernoulli bandit. Okay. And you can generalize this to any distribution of outcomes for your rewards. So it's even more general than that. Then the basic results, which is due to Lie and Robbins. I think it's uh, it is okay. I don't remember the the year at the moment. Uh, the Lie Robbins bound says that the number of times that you pick a suboptimal decision. scales like log n. And actually, you can prove that 
the following closer result, which is uh, that the limit as t goes to infinity of suboptimal divided by log times the number of trials is bounded from above by some positive constant, which I'm not writing here, but it's related to the kullback liber divergences in the system. So this result is stating exactly this thing, that you suggested that log of log t, but this would violate this bound. Log of log t is not exploring enough. And this is essentially a consequence of large division theory. So there are statistical limits to the power with which you can win at these games. Yes? Uh, yeah, see, I see the point, so let me just go over. Yeah, so it's, yeah, I see what the point that you're making. Um, okay, I, I will have, need some time to figure out clearly what, what was raining, so but uh, we can discuss about this later. Uh, yeah? What is? Is any, is any positive constant? Is it, it's a one constant which can be expressed in terms of the distributions of these rewards, okay? There's a bound here, and you have to, you cannot trespass this bound, which is positive, which means that the number of times that you make bad actions cannot go too slow, okay? They, they hold for all distribution, they just the, the C, that changes. It's uh, distribution dependent. This quantity is distribution dependent. All right. So um, it was a long, long detour for for just uh, actually um, showing you that that there are several interesting uh, uh, problems that have, have to be faced when when the information is is incomplete. Uh, in in fact, I would like to show you. Uh, this would be basically the, the last thing um, I'm, uh, I'm going to tell you about the, the course is uh, actually a way of uh, interpreting these results in terms of one specific uh, algorithm, which is Q-learning. Okay. So let, let's go back again to this situation and ask ourselves the following. Okay, so this is what. Okay, so let's let's start from uh, the uh, the Bellman equation for this problem. Okay, so in this particular case, it's it's pretty simple because the Bellman equation, which governs the uh, the quantity. So there, there were two equations for, for Q1 and Q2. These are Q0 and Q1. These are dependent on epsilon, okay? So these are the uh, quality function in the epsilon, epsilon regularized problem. And then in this case, you will have to uh, write down the equation as follows. Well, yeah. The equation for Q reads, um, Maybe put it here somewhere. Yeah. So the optimality equation for any action, in this case for bandit problems, is just the reward, average reward that you get from that bandit, plus gamma epsilon log of the sum of all actions of the exponential of Q of the actions divided by. Epsilon. 
And the policy associated with this, which is the choice of the action is So these are the optimality equations with regularization for the bandit problems. And these are the averages that you get, average rewards that you get when you play action A in general. Uh, so, and when, then we show that we can turn these equations into a stochastic approximation algorithm. And this stochastic approximation algorithm, what it does is uh, uh, the following. It's, it replaces these values with estimates. So this is a time t plus one, our estimate of how much I can get out of that action is equal to the instantaneous return that I get from that action, which I dubbed at t plus one, uh, plus gamma. the estimate at the previous time, and then minus Q. T. Okay. So we interpret this as the, as the error that the agent is making. And the idea is that uh, this algorithm is correcting for overestimates and underestimates, and then eventually, given an appropriate scheduling of alpha and a certain way by which we decrease your, our parameter epsilon, which now you can clearly see as an interpretation in terms of exploration. In that case, we will converge to the optimal uh, uh, behavior in the long run. Uh, so now we want to write exactly this equation for our particular specific case. It's the policy of time t for our specific case of this decision-making problem, okay? So how do they look like? So let's start with this arm here. If I take action zero, and suppose I start with an expectation which is I, I'm not gonna get anything if I wait. Okay. I know this in advance, so I can set Q at all times for making decision zero equal to zero. This I know. It's my estimate and it's perfect because uh, every time I observe that will not be changed by this. So I know that picking up action zero will always give me zero as a value. This is the part of the model that I know. And then I'm just left with an equation for one quantity which I will call QT, which is just QT of one. This is the relevant thing. It's my estimate of how much I will get if I play action one in this case. And I'm just calling this with a, with a simplified notation. Then what will be the equation for my only variable QT? Well, I can, I can write it down here. So this thing, of course, takes place only when the action that I pick here is 80, so I can actually choose this. So, yeah? Because this part of the model we know. We know that if we wait, we are not going to get anything. So, Q, Q is, but this is Q hat is your guess. Okay, so and we work. Q hat is just your guess, and then you, you expect this upon iteration to get to the optimum, right? Okay, it's, just it's just the initial guess. Your initial, you have to start somewhere and then choose it. In this particular case, you can start exactly at the correct point when you expect that nothing will be getting out of that. Again, because P is positive, etc. It's larger than one alpha. So, so if we if we write down the equation now for Q, what will happen is that 
the small qt plus one, will be the previous one, plus the learning rate. And then here we're going to get several options, right? Uh, so let's write it this way. OK, alpha goes there. So if we pick action 0, nothing will change. Because our estimate will not be changing. So this will stay the same because this object is 0. We are not picking the action 1, so this is 0. We are not updating our knowledge of the estimate. So this is going to be 0. And how often does this happen? Well, the probability with which this happens is the probability of action 0, which under this definition, we, I have that phi t of action 0 is just 1 over 1 plus exponential of qt over epsilon. And obviously, the probability at the same time of picking action 1 is this one. So the probability with which I'm picking this action and therefore I'm getting a 0 is uh, uh, 1 over 1 plus exponential of qt divided by epsilon. Then if I pick the other action, two things can happen. Either I get a plus 1 here, in which case this will become 1 plus gamma epsilon logarithm, and I have to sum the two terms, so it's going to be 1 plus the exponential of this, and then I have to subtract minus qt. And this happens with probability. The probability of picking that other action, which is e with qt over epsilon 1 plus times p, because that's the probability that I get a plus 1 here. Or I get a minus 1, same thing, otherwise, where otherwise means 1 minus p times this which is the other thing that is lacking in order to have probability 1 between all possible events. So this is the algorithm at work with a given epsilon. And the idea is that this algorithm should converge to the best value for this Q, which is up here. when epsilon goes to 0. Okay. This is, again, just the soft Q-learning algorithm. For this specific case, you can write it in full. Good. And from now on, that, that line below is the, one, the only one that I would need. So this is. Relatively simple because it's just a jump process on the line. Okay. Instead of what sigma? The sigma, what do you mean, the sigma? Yeah, yeah, the softmax. Yeah, it's here. Why is 
Sorry, I'm lost with about the sigma because I don't see any sigma. Ah, the sum here is just over two actions, right? There are two contributions. One, which has exponential of zero, and the other one, which has the exponential of Q1. Okay, that's, I just exposed the sum. Okay. So the question we're asking is, is this algorithm going to reach the best and optimal value for Q? It's just, it's just a jump process. Sometimes you stay in place, Sometimes you drift with a plus term which pushes you to the right and you want to increase your estimate of the value for the thing that you're doing. But sometimes you get a minus and this will tell you, okay, this is not a good thing to do, was not a good thing to do, so I will just recede my estimate to, low, to, more, to smaller values of Q. In what sense? It, it's a stochastic process, right? It's, it's making jumps on this. It, it's the basis of this, uh, of this stochastic approximation algorithm. So one way of, of understanding qualitatively what is happening for this kind of algorithms is to take the situation where, where this learning rate is small. So if we take this thing small, the process will proceed in, in small steps. And we can make a continuum approximation in time. And we will turn this process into something which is a drift process with noise. Okay, can you see that it's just taking the continuous time limit. If we are gonna take this process long enough in time and we are allowing for small steps, alpha, then we can study how this process evolves as a continuous deterministic process. And this is what, this is what uh, people actually do in order to study the convergence properties of this kind of algorithms in the, in the long term limit. So if I take this limit, this, this object here will become the time derivative. So when alpha is small, in a, in a sense, this will become, tend to become this kind of deterministic behavior. So what do I have? I have to combine all these three events in order to get the mean drift for my process. Okay, so with probability this, it stays to zero, so this doesn't contribute to the drift. The Q in Q, in the, on the Q line, the process doesn't move. If I pick this action, it will move by this amount, okay? Now, in order to avoid complicated things, let me just set for simplicity gamma equals zero here. Okay. Here I will set gamma equals zero. You know from the calculation that it really doesn't matter, right? So it will change how much you get, but it doesn't change the policy. Just because you're always getting back to the initial state and you repeat and you repeat and you repeat. So this will just change the overall factor, but it doesn't change the policy. In this particular system, when you just have one state, gamma doesn't matter. It will change the numerical values, but it won't affect the substance of the policy. So for simplicity, we can set gamma equals zero, and things will become very, very simple. If you have more than one state, then gamma is important, okay? And it's important to take into account. But for that particular case, we can forget about these terms here because this is just the look ahead in the future. And then we get something which is very simple because on average, this thing will behave like uh, this times this quantity minus this. So overall, this becomes 2p minus 1 minus there's a q in both, in both cases. And then there is this factor here, which I can rewrite as one plus exponential of minus Q over epsilon. Plus noise, okay? Which I'm not writing, it's a more, little bit more complicated expression I'm not writing. But you can derive it. If you compute the, the variance of the jumps, you will end up with some expression for the noise 
and this will become a drift diffusion process in the limit with a relatively complicated noise. So let's, let's just forget about this and, and focus on this object. So where is this deterministic system going? So this is a very simple one-dimensional dynamical system in the Q space. And we expect this object to behave like this when we schedule our learning rates appropriately. So it's good to, to have a look at that. So how, do, how does it behave? Well, we can plot Q dot as a function of Q, which is this function, for different values of epsilon to see how it looks. And then here I'm, I'm plotting just one simple case. But if we can figure out analytically, very simple. So if Q is positive and larger than epsilon, we can neglect this thing. And here this term is linear and goes like this. So this is a very nice region to work for our approximation algorithm. Okay? Because this is the function we want to find the zero about, and it's monotonous, it's decreasing. So if I start with my guess in this region, then it's fine. Because my algorithm corrects for this. If it finds, okay, it's positive, then decrease Q. It's negative, then increase Q. And then you go on with little and little steps, and then you converge to this point, which is actually exactly the best thing that you can do when gamma is zero, okay? So this part is fine. But now let's have a look at what happens when we go to negative Q. So if our guess in, at the moment is on the wrong side, because out of bad luck we had that sequence of negative events, which are here in the noise. So this noise brought us to have an estimate which is negative which is far from the real optimal value of the game. Then in this case, what happens? Well, this stays the same. But now this prefactor becomes large because Q is negative. So what is happening here is that you have a situation like this. And here this is decreasing exponentially fast. And then if you increase epsilon, eventually, when epsilon is very, very small, you get some curve like this. You go like this, and then fall off very rapidly here. So this is for epsilon tending to zero. Eventually, it becomes a sawtooth profile like this, and then falls down, and then it's zero. Exactly. The meaning between epsilon, yeah, that's what I'm going to do in a second. Epsilon, like I said, if you look at the policy, okay, this is the probability of picking action zero. Epsilon is the rate of exploration. If you send it to zero, you will never do that for positive Q. And we, you will always do that for negative Q. So if I draw the policy, so the probability, as a function of Q, I can draw the probability of picking action one. And this is going to be like this. And if I increase, if I decrease epsilon, then it's going to be like this. This is one, oh, both of them are in one. So epsilon controls the width of this transition. It's pretty much like, like the weight in a neural, neural, right? So 
When a term tends to zero, the response is very sharp, and you go either one policy or the other, depending if you're negative or positive, which is the, the actual thing that optimizes your, your process. But if you have an epsilon large, then you will explore. It means that sometimes you will choose this, even though you know that the optimal one is more close to this. So epsilon is the parameter in which, in this case, controls the exploration, which favors the entropy against the maximization of the, of the cost, of the gain, sorry. Good. So notice that this effect here, the fact that this curve falls off here, is, is exactly due to the fact of the frequency with which you choose to explore. This is exactly that probability, the probability by which you pick action one. So what's the problem with this? Well, everything is, is perfect and very fine if you happen to lie on the positive side of Q. Because if you're here, your Q dot will be positive and will send you here. Here, your Q dot will be negative and it will send you back to center. So this is a stable fixed point for the algorithm here. It's a global fixed point for any positive epsilon because here still it's positive. For any finite epsilon, it's positive. But it's exponentially small. So eventually, if you lie here, it will take an extremely long time to go over. It's something which looks like a system when you have a big, nice potential well. Actually, this drift is, is pretty much like you had a parabolic well into which your particle will fall. But then at some point, this potential flattens. So you have one side of your potential, something like, if you think about it in terms of potential, it would be something like this. So when you're here, your, your, your particle will move very, very slowly. And if you set up the exploration to zero, it will not move at all. So there will be a truly set of metastable states which don't go anywhere if you don't explore, if you don't add some noise, if you, if you don't move your, your system. So what's the best thing to do again? In this case, what you would like to do is to start off with, a, with an epsilon which is large, which would make this bump larger and much, much to the left. So your potential would be something like, more like uh, initially something like this, very smooth. And then as you slowly let your particle fall, then you can close it up. Basically, when, when you're sufficiently sure that your particle is within this range, then you, you can really go down for exploration. But still, nonetheless, sometimes they can climb up because of noise. So the, there's a limit about in which you can pull it down. And the last thing that I want to tell you is that, of course, like we said, this is controlled by this parameter epsilon here. Okay. So now let's forget for a second entirely the decision-making process and ask the question. If this were a problem of finding a minimum and you had this problem of having a large set of metastable states, how, how would you tackle it in a, in a numerical simulation? So one possible solution is to do what is called simulated annealing, which can tackle even more complicated problems in which you really have other minima. So the idea is that you keep your temperature high at the beginning, and then you lower it down. But epsilon is temperature here in all of our physical analogy. So in this case, what we're doing is exactly very much the kind of thing that you would do with simulated annealing in a different language with some notable distinctions. But nonetheless, if you study the problem of simulated annealing, you will discover that 
In that case as well, there's a rate at which you can go and lower your temperature that is a hard bound. You cannot just switch off your temperature very rapidly because your system will be stuck somewhere. And what's the law in time by which you lower your temperature in simulated annealing? It's logarithmic in time. So that's the same, exactly the same reason for which we had this bound. Now interpreted in a language, in a physical language. Okay. All these connections are qualitatively clear. Not all of them have been studied in, uh, in full extent. So there's, there's still a lot uh, to do and to study about these systems. And uh, there is a, an emerging belief that many techniques from statistical physics could be the relevant language in order to understand and describe all these things, other than, of course, the usual and complementary languages of mathematical statistics and decision-making theory. So there's a large, probably a very large research avenue in that direction uh, as well. Uh, so this was basically the last thing I wanted to say. I, I don't have time actually to approach any other uh, subject in the in these remaining uh, minutes. Uh, I would just like to, to sum up by telling you about things that were not covered by uh, by this course in, in any part. Uh, all all the discussion and the and the algorithms that I presented are deeply rooted in this notion of value of a state or value of a state action, which is extremely fruitful uh, language. Uh, all these kind of algorithms are, are go under the name of learning with a critic. In the sense that these value functions act as a critic with respect to what the agent decides to do. So the agent has not a teacher with, which says, this is the good action, this is the bad action. Once you are wrong, you say, corrects and guides, like in supervised learning. In reinforcement learning, the best that you can have is to have a critic, to have a system which gives you, provides information, feedback, in the form of a general encouragement or criticism, depending on what you do, and that's the basis of this algorithm. But it's important to, to know that these are not the unique ways to approach uh, the decision-making process. In fact, if you think about it from the beginning, the goal is just to optimize over a policy. So your value, your gain, is a function of the policy. So can you just bypass all these notions of value functions and Q functions in order to find effective algorithms? Yes, you can. You can devise algorithms which work directly in the space of policies and do a search in policy space. So you just give up completely with the notion of a critic. And this class of algorithms are called actor-only algorithms because everything is in the mind of the actor, which has a policy and tries to improve it and does make, doesn't make any recourse to the knowledge of a value function or over which it collects uh, and stores information about how good the environment is in different, space, in different spaces. These are very valuable because sometimes it's very difficult to construct value functions, like we said, like using uh, uh, neural networks to construct an approximation for the value function. So you can dispense of this altogether. If, if the number of actions that you can take is small, then it might be more common, even if the configuration space is large, the environment is, is uh, very high dimensional, it might be a good idea to use these policy gradient techniques, which search in directly in the space of, uh, of strategies. This also is, is a very well developed, uh, there's a very, very well developed mathematics behind them, which we don't touch at all, but you can find them discussed at length in the, uh, in the reinforcement learning book. So the the it so it depends so situation from situation, right? Uh, I I cannot really say 
that there is a generic advantage. In some situations, policy gradient is better. In some other value-based uh, uh, methods are better. It turns out that, that many algorithms are value-based in the practical things. So like uh, the examples we we're discussing with the uh, AlphaGo is value-based. But for instance, many algorithms which run on robots are just using policy gradient techniques. So I cannot make a firm statement saying this is, this is better than the other. There are benefits, pros and cons, depending on the structure of the actions that you have to take, on how you can parameterize these, these policies, etc. So there's no, not a unique uh, answer to this, uh, to this problem. And then there's a third uh, big architecture of decision-making algorithms, which combines the two, basically. And these are called actor-critical algorithms in which the agent does both things. Searches for policies and improves knowledge, and, but using both of them, not just focusing only on the value and then deriving the policy or only on the policy. And these are also very interesting. Of course, that, and this is something which is uh, very much uh, debated and uh, subject of current study in neuroscience. There are evidences that some of these algorithms are actually implemented in our brain. So there's clear experimental evidence that in our brain there is a, a reward system mediated by dopamine signals, and there are neurons which actually compute temporal difference errors. So there are neurons in our mind, in our brain, well, we know for sure in monkeys, but we, we assume that there are, there are there also in our brain, which compute objects which are algorithmically equivalent to the kind of things that we've been discussing for reinforcement learning. And there are parts of our brain structures which seem to act like an actor-critic algorithm. Okay. So there's a lot of work in neuroscience which tries to understand how our, our brain works in some, with some specific task uh, and compare this directly with uh, completely theoretical knowledge coming from uh, from decision processes. Uh, there are also many other interesting issues which I've not been able to touch upon and I just want to mention very briefly, uh, at least a couple of them, which are again, subject of current research and very interesting subjects. One problem is the so-called inverse reinforcement learning problem. This is, a, try, this is a way of trying to answer to the question, suppose that I observe an agent who is doing a certain series of actions. I see somebody acting some, somehow, and the big question is, can I reconstruct why he is acting like that? What's the goal for the agent? Can I do this inverse inference process of, from actions, deduce what was the goal? What were the rewards that he was after? Is this possible? So this is, in general, of course, an ill-defined problem because there might be many different kinds of rewards which produce the same behavior. But then, being so ill-defined is also very interesting because you may find a way of defining it in a, in a better way and then try to do this process of uh, inverse inference from behavior to motivations, which is, of course, very interesting in itself. A related problem is the problem that goes under the name of reward shaping. So what's the idea of reward shaping? Uh, so this originates in a, in a, in a behavioral experiments of Skinner, uh, who's one of the fathers of uh, behavioral psychology. Uh, Skinner was working with pigeons, and he wanted to make this kind of experiments in which, okay, if the pigeon uh, puts his beak onto some particular button, then it will get uh, one grain uh, as a reward. But when, when in practice, when you put a pigeon in a cage, okay, unless the cage is really very, very small, it might take a very long time. You remember the video from the mouse, okay? It was a really very much confined environment, and it took several trials before it discovered that. So in order to overcome this sl slow, learning of what was the behavior, even before that this was rewarded anywhere, okay? Because the, the, the pigeon has to 
discover that it has to go to the button before getting any possible reward. And in meanwhile, it doesn't get any reward. So it's a very, very flat space of actions that he has to explore. There's no particular reason for going there. Then it must be something done at random. And if the arena is large enough, if your search space is large enough, it might take forever before you hit randomly on the right spot. And then at that, at that point, you will be able to learn. So, so there is a long transit before you start to learn. And so what Skinner did, of course, it, in hindsight, it's very, it's very simple. He put the grain somewhere close to the bottom, available to the pigeon. So the first thing that the pigeon learned is, is to go closer to the bottom. And then basically, he made a little trail of grains. And then the pigeon learned very quickly to go to the bottom. Where, after that, then the process initiated. So this is a way of shaping rewards. You want to obtain some, some action, but you can induce it by changing the rewards. In mathematical terms, this means if I have some behavior, some optimal policy, it can originate from very different arrangements of rewards. So think about the following problem. Suppose that you have to locate a target, like in grid world. There is an arena. There are obstacles which you can visit and boundaries. You start from here and you want to locate a target here by finding out the shortest path, okay? So one possible way of giving rewards is I don't give any reward. Only when, you, when the agent gets to the target, it gets its price. This is the kind of thing that happens when you just have very little information. And un unless you stumble onto this, you will not be able to discover that there is a target altogether. And then when you discovered it, then this slowly propagates back, and then you will find eventually this behavior. But there's a very large, very narrow bottleneck in, in terms of entropy of the kind of trials that you have to do before getting there by chance. But then remember, your task was finding the shortest path. Now suppose now you give a different kind of rewards. In another way, for instance, imagine that the target produces some kind of signal which diffuses. And the agent is able to catch the signal. Then if the agent interprets the signal as a reward, then it will climb up much faster because it will be able to infer from the signal the location of the reward. The final result of this process is the same. Eventually, the agent will go from S to T on the shortest path. But the speed of learning in the second case is much different. So if you care about one specific behavior, there are ways of changing the rewards in order to obtain optimal results and in learning, in learning time. And this is very interesting and important in practice because you have to, if you have to train a robot or you have to train an algorithm and you choose a structure of rewards which has a long transient where you're not really uh, encouraging your agent in doing the good action, then it will take a long time. But otherwise, if you shape accurately your rewards, you will get exactly the same accurate behavior, optimal, in a much shorter time. And of course, I'm just describing this by words, but there, there are ways of making these concepts uh, uh, quantitative and theorems about uh, what is the class of shapings of rewards which uh, are allowed, that is the one that preserve the same optimal policy. OK, um, with this, I think uh, I'm done. Uh, to, tomorrow, there will be the exam. And it's going to be a series of questions and small exercises with multiple choices. So you should be able to tackle that. Uh, today at 2.30, we have this interactive section, session on uh, uh, work, law, and ethics. Uh, uh, in the age of artificial intelligence. Enjoy the lunch. Oh, yeah, question.